There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Self-publishing is something that has absolutely changed my life. You do have to put a lot of work in in the beginning to write the book and launch the book and market the book. But after that, it becomes very passive. My two books are now bringing in five to 10 grand per month in profit, almost entirely passively. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Compton Game, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, And what makes millennials tick? Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. In a recent article on CNBC, more than half or 51% of Americans have less than three months worth of emergency savings. The pandemic has definitely made a mark on savings. In my opinion, it's really shown that you just need more than three months worth of savings in your quote unquote, all hell broke loose fund. But in that same breath, I know this can be really hard to do. And I have struggled with this myself over the years. Yeah, sure, you could save more money. But you know, that isn't always a fun or even possible option. So what about making more money? We have had countless guests on the pod over the last few years talking about different ways to build a side hustle and then just create more cash flow. In this episode, you're going to hear another one of those stories. You know Rachel Richards. She's been on the show before for her rental real estate empire, but she's also built a very admirable cash flowing monthly revenue from her book sales on Amazon. As a future writer myself, fingers crossed, toes crossed, everything crossed, (laughs) I was really curious. Can you build substantial revenue from writing a book and self-publishing it on Amazon? Is that even possible? Even if you don't profess to be a writer, surely there is something you have to share, maybe a skill or a talent or an idea. Well, Rachel's here to pull back the curtains and share the behind the scenes story of how she built a cash flowing, self-publishing side hustle in just a few years, and how you can do the same. I'm so thrilled to bring you this episode. I'm Shauna Compton Game. This is Millennial Money. Let's get on with the show. Well, Rachel, welcome back to the podcast. It's so fun to have you here and 
Talk about another one of your passive income strategies, self-publishing, which I'm personally very curious about. So thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited for this episode. So take me back to when you made the decision, okay, I'm going to write my first book. Your first book was Money, Honey. How did you decide that self-publishing was the way you wanted to go? That's a great question. I used to be enamored with the idea of a traditional book deal. And I think everyone is. I thought if I get a traditional book deal, they're going to do all the marketing and the promotion and it's going to be huge and I won't have to do anything. And I didn't want to do marketing and promotion. Who does? It's the worst part. (laughs) It's very intimidating. I just wanted to write the book and be done with it. So I was leaning towards that at first. And of course, I started doing research. I started asking around other authors to see what their experience was. And after really looking into it, I realized that that wasn't the case at all. And when you get a traditional book deal with a publisher, they still expect you, the author, to do 99% of the marketing and promotion. Wow. The only exception is if you're somebody like Stephen King or you know a huge author, and then they're actually going to send you on a book tour and really put some money behind you. Anybody else, they still expect you to do everything. I was really shocked by that. And the other thing is the royalty split is so different. So when you get a traditional book deal you're going to get a 10 to 15% royalty. But when you self-publish on Amazon, for example, you can get a 35 to 70% royalty. I like those numbers better. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, if I'm going to do all the hard work anyways, all the marketing and promotion anyways, why am I going to give up my royalty to a publisher? It just didn't make any sense to me. Um, Not to mention that when you self-publish, you get to retain all of the creative control over your book, the manuscript and the cover and all of the creative control. The the one thing that a publisher has that is self that when you self-publish you don't get is that they can get your book in physical bookstores like Barnes and Noble and all that stuff. I just didn't feel like that was as important anymore because I don't know about you. I don't know the last time I was in a physical bookstore. I order all my Years. stuff online anyways. Yeah. So I decided to self-publish and I'm really happy that I did. And I really think that first-time authors and anyone looking to write a book should strongly consider self-publishing over getting a traditional book deal. Do you think our mindset is changing a little bit around the self-publishing versus traditional? Because when you when you look at a book, I don't look at like, oh, who published this book? I look at this book and is this book good? And I feel like with Amazon and how easy it is, to self-publish these days that most people don't care if your book is a traditional published book or self-published book. I 100% agree. I never cared. I never gave a second thought to it. For me, it was about whether the book was good and the reviews and whether it was something that was going to add value to me, not whether there was some big publishing name behind it. I agree. And I want to get back to all of the how-tos, but first, just because I feel like this is an important thing for people listening to really understand. Tell us a bit about the passive income that you earn from Money Honey and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement. Like, How is this a really strong piece of your overall passive income strategy? Yeah, it's astonishing to me the money that I earn from these books. And it's definitely just to level set expectations. Other self-published authors have told me that I'm like a unicorn. And there are not (laughs) many self-published authors that earn as much money from their books as I do. So I I do think it's a little bit rare. Um, I earn anywhere between five and 10 grand a month in profit from my two books combined. So I actually think this year, 2021, is going to be the first year that I hit six figures from my, my book royalties. Wow, that it that is incredible. I mean, it's it's so impressive and one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on to talk about this because even though you you are this unicorn, you're also an example that it's possible. Uh do you have any ideas why maybe your books, I mean other than being really good, but why your books have have done so well? Yeah, a lot I think I have a lot of ideas and and what I'll first say too is that even if you're only making $500 or $1,000, and I say even if you're only making, like that's a lot of money. That's a huge passive income stream from a self-published book. And if you're making that much, you're doing an amazing job. That's a lot of money. And I think where most self-published authors make the money is off of their other products and services. 
So when you go out and self-publish a book, you can also have the intent of not making a ton of money as a passive income stream, but offering other products like one-on-one coaching or online courses or other passive income streams. So a lot of people use them as lead generators or even sell the books at 99 cents or even use them as a freebie, like a lead generator, so that they can sell their other higher price products. I think that's a more common technique to use the self-published books to lead into more higher price passive income streams, if that makes sense. Um, So there's two ways to kind of do it. But in terms of why mine sell so much, I think I had great, I had solid launch strategies, which we can definitely dive deep into. I think they're also just well-written books. So once that I launched them well, they continue to spread word of mouth. And then I've also just had a very long, ongoing organic marketing strategy. So let's talk a little bit about the writing process. So before we even get the book out in people's hands, What was the process that you went through to decide the name, the chapters, and then write all the words? Walk us through that that whole process. I figured the process out mostly on my own, but also with the help of another book, which is called Published by Chandler Bolt. And that's all I did. I read this book and I followed this book's process and I wrote my own. I didn't really invest in a program or hire anybody I followed the book's process. So I, sp- I always speak very highly of Chandler Bolt and his book published. So when I started with Money Honey, I had the idea first and foremost, because I was a former financial advisor and my family and friends were coming to me for financial advice, which is great. That's what I love to do. That made me very happy. And I began to wonder, well, why aren't they reading books or learning on their own. And then I had this epiphany where I was like, oh yeah, personal finance is boring for most people, right? It's right. overwhelming, it's intimidating, it's complex. And so I began to wonder to myself, well, how can I make this topic sassy and fun and simple? And that's where the idea for Money Honey came from. So I had this sort of inspiration. I had this idea I was excited about. And then it was like, well, how do I turn this into a book? I had no idea where to begin. So I read this book published And I started with a mind map. I just kind of put everything down on paper. And then I started to lump the similar ideas together into what could be sections or chapters. Then I turned things into an outline. And then I made it an even more detailed outline. And then I started writing a first draft. Now, the key with the first draft and the mistake I made at first is that I was editing as I was writing. Um, And later, yeah, as I became a more experienced author and what I've heard from other authors is that you don't edit as you write. Because I was like, okay, my first draft has to be great. It needs to be edited. It needs to be perfect. And it's like, wait, no, the first draft is meant to be awful. It's a first draft. That's the whole (laughs) point of it. The the point is that you just get it done. You just get your writing out on paper. It's not going to be pretty. Don't get caught up in trying to edit it as you go and make it pretty. It's the first draft. You're going to have multiple rounds of editing and revision after that. So, you know, don't so don't get hung up on that. Just get get everything out on paper and get the first draft written as quickly as possible. Um, the writing process took me nine months, but wow. okay. I also was working full time investing in real estate. So I didn't have a lot of time. I could have done it a lot faster. And I, I had a moment of crisis, I will say, about halfway through. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. And I, I quit writing the book four months in. I quit writing the book. And it was because I had a complete mental 180. And I told myself things like, who do you think you are, Rachel, to write a book about finance? Who's going to listen to you? You're a young woman. Your writing is crap. It's going to be embarrassing if you go through with this. Who do you think you are? So I stopped writing the book. I quit writing it. I had no intention of ever picking it back up again. And a few weeks later, luckily, or maybe it was a couple months, I sat down with a friend and I kind of confessed to her my book idea. And she said, Rachel, you have to finish what you set out to do. You're really onto something here. I can tell. Just just finish this book. And she gave me just enough encouragement that I picked the manuscript back up. And at the end of the day, the way I was able to get myself to finish this book and publish it is I told myself, if I can just help one person, that's all I want to do. That's all I care about. It wasn't about making money. It wasn't about 
starting a business. Like I, I didn't even cross my mind at the time. I was truly, if I could just help one person, that's all I cared about. And that's the only reason I went through with publishing it at the end. You bring up a good point. I think we all can relate to whether we have a course or we have a podcast or we have a book or we have anything that we want to, I'll use the word kind of birth out into the world. It's very scary and it's really easy in your head to get so convoluted and and go through those those negative mindset patterns of who am I and what do I have to offer? What advice would you give to somebody listening who who has the spark of the idea but is really stuck in that place of of the who am I? Well, it's the scariest feeling. And it's not just me that feels it. It's every author and creator and entrepreneur, anyone putting something out there in the world for other people to see and judge has gone through this. And I didn't know the term for it at the time, but it was the imposter syndrome. I felt like a fraud. I felt like I wasn't good enough to to do this. The advice that I would give is you you are good enough and you do have a unique voice to to share with the world. You you need to surround yourself with the right people. People like my friend Lindsay who when I told her about my book idea, she basically was like, cut the crap, get this book out there. (laughs) You need to do this. And then also think about what happens if you don't do this? What if somebody out there is really struggling and if they hear your message, it will change their life? What if you don't do this and they continue to suffer because you're afraid? I mean, that's a shame. Mm -hmm. And that's a powerful thing to think about. And I think about that now because after launching Money Honey, I think about the thousands of messages I've received from people all over the world who have thanked me and have told me I've changed their life. They've paid off their student loan debt and their credit cards, and they're not living paycheck to paycheck anymore. And they've made their first trade in the stock market and all these amazing things. And and not to like not to brag or try to build myself up or anything, but my book changed their life in a way. And so it's a shame if I hadn't gone through with publishing it. Right. I, and where would they be? And not like I've changed their life in some huge way. But if you don't put it out there, then you're not serving somebody that really, really might need you. So you have to do it. And while we're kind of on this subject, what about the negative reviews? Because we live in this society right now where somebody doesn't like something, they're going to let you know. How do you deal with that as an author? It's literally the worst thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst. I don't look at them anymore. I used to look at them and now I, I don't look at them and I refuse to because it it hurts me too bad. <laughs> and I have grown a thick skin in a lot of other areas, but for some reason, the, the one-star reviews and the two-star reviews on my books, I take too personally. So I avoid them altogether. Because isn't it interesting how our brains will trick us into believing the one one-star review over the 99 five-star reviews. Like, why? Why do we 100%. do that? hundred percent. It's so weird. Um, so I avoid them. And then also, though, you, you learn to laugh at them because I have looked at them before. And there's this one that I love. There's this a one-star review that I love. And my <laughs> one of my author friends and I started looking at our one-star reviews one day, and we were just laughing hysterically at them, reading them aloud to one another. And that was one of my favorite memories But I do want to get this one printed out and framed because it was, I've heard this before, but it was like, if I, (laughs) this is so bad. It's so funny. If it was like, if I had a a gun with two bullets and I was in a room with Hitler and Stalin and this book, I would shoot this book twice. (laughs) What? (laughs) The fact that someone could even (laughs) type those words and put them out in public domain, I think is crazy. (laughs) But it makes me laugh. Like it legitimately, the creativity. (laughs) Right. (laughs) They really Um, went there, didn't they? (laughs) They did. I was like, wow. I mean, points for creativity. I I mean, I I thoroughly enjoy that one. So So you have to learn to laugh at it and just not take it personally. And, And the thing is, another thing my friend told me is it's a good thing if you have haters because that means there's so many people out there that are reading your book and not everyone's going to love your book. And that's just, it's just math. It's just a numbers game. So if you're starting to get people and you're starting to get one-star reviews, you're doing the right thing because your book is getting out there. I share sort of a similar theory with podcast reviews. <laughs> yeah. It's the same thing. If, if you put anything out into the world these days, I mean, you could even be just 
gently on Instagram and, and somebody comes along and kind of knocks you sideways. But I like that advice about really being able to laugh and, and also surrounding yourself with people who are like, okay, this is, this is probably not true. I love that. Yeah. So I, I'm curious if you had any expectations about the book before you launched it. Did you have like a goal in mind or were you just kind of um, thinking, you know, whatever this does, this does? I had literally zero expectations. Um, I didn't even know if anyone besides my family and friends would buy it or read it. And it was just such a self-esteem thing. It came back to the imposter syndrome and I had zero confidence in my abilities. And I think that maybe helped it sell well, I guess, instead of me being this person that was out to make money and be this pushy person and buy my book and blah, 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 I guess being a little bit more humble and really having the approach of, I, I truly just wanted to help people and I wasn't out to make money. I think it did help it sell better in the beginning. So that was a good thing. Um, I only spent $600, less than $600 on the launch. So I can talk a little bit more about the budget and, and who I hired and who I think you should have on your team. But really my goal and my hope in the beginning was just to recoup that money. I was like, if I can just make back the money that I spent, because I was like broke at the time. I was like, that would be amazing. If I could just make this back eventually, even if it, t- it takes a year, I will be happy with that. So I think that was my hope, but really I had zero expectations. And I made that money back in the first month. And then I made, wow. I was making like, yeah, so I made 600 bucks. And then I was making, I think, a thousand a month, even immediately after that and over the course of the next year. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps. But I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. Gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash ETM. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, 
I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member FDIC. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. That's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. What about the editing process? Did, Did you edit yourself or did you hire an editor? So I'm a really strong writer and editor, and I'm really bad at spending money on people and delegating, but I at least had the foresight back then to recognize that I needed a good editor. And there were a few things I spent my money on, and there were a few things I wish I had spent my money on, but an editor was one of them. I found somebody who was up and coming, really promising, did a really, really amazing job, and I found her on Fiverr. And she was working for an editing company at the time, but she had just started going out on her own. So I got her at an amazing rate. Like you wouldn't even be able to hire somebody at this rate now. I think I paid her 250 or 350 bucks (laughs) to edit the book. Yeah. (laughs) But like she did amazing work. And now I would say you you would expect to spend $750 to $1,500 on a really good editor of her quality. so I, I got I lucked out on that and found a great editor. And then I also spent some money. I think I spent maybe 75 bucks on advertising. I also tried to hire a cover designer on Fiverr, but the mistake I made was I was spending like 15 and 25 dollars to try to get a few different cover options made. And it wasn't enough money to get anything of any quality made. So I spent money and didn't end up using them. That was a mistake because the cover is one of the most important parts of the book. Right. And you don't want to underspend there. So if you're looking to write a book, there's there's really three people you absolutely need to spend money on. And don't be cheap on it like, like I was. An editor, a cover designer. And I recommend using 99designs.com and spending $400. That's what I've done since my first book. And then an interior formatter. So I ended up doing the interior formatting for myself for the first book, and it turned out okay, but it was a huge mistake because I underestimated how hard it would be, and trying to figure it out on my own was a disaster. There was like 14-hour days in the days leading up to my book launch where I was trying to get the formatting down, and (laughs) it was the most stressful thing ever, and I should not have done that. Um, and then what I ended up doing for the cover is I did it on my own on Photoshop. So again, these are these are just the most naive mistakes that a self-published author does. And if you see, like, you can't find it now, but if you saw the original version of Money Honey from 2017, it very much looks like a self-published book. It doesn't look professional. It looks like something that you that somebody did at their home because I did. Luckily, it still sold well because it was such a well-written book. And since then, I ended up putting out a second edition in 2019 where I did have it formatted. I had a whole cover redesigned, and now it looks a lot more professional. So between those three people that you suggest everybody hire, what kind of cost range are you looking at? Um, an editor, again, on on the low end, you would spend $750, but you probably are going to be spending a lot more than that. $1,500 is a more reasonable estimate, and it depends on the word count of your book. Because normally editors charge by the word count. And then an interior formatter, you could probably spend three to four hundred dollars. 
and you could find somebody on Upwork. And then a cover design, I've always done the $400 option on 99designs.com. So, so I guess total like Relatively small. Yeah. yeah. It's still money. Yeah. But if you look at the projections of what you could make back, it, uh, it starts to look a little bit better. So yeah. tell us about the launch because I know, I mean, that's the critical part to, to selling the book, to get it in people's hands. What did you do and maybe what did you wish you would have done? The launch, there's a few different launch strategies. And again, I always go back to this book published by Chandler Bolt, but the launch strategy that I did for Money Honey is I did a free launch. So I put it on Amazon. I had the ebook and the paperback options at that time. I didn't have an audiobook yet. I I do have audiobooks now for both. But the ebook, the launch strategy was to make the ebook free for the first three or four days. And I made the paperback book as low in price as it would allow me. So I think the paperback was $9.99 for the first few days. And then every week or every few days after that, I would increase both of them by a dollar. So after the first few days, it went up to 99 cents and 1099. And I would increase them by a dollar every few days. So that was basically the free launch strategy. And so people are like, well, why would you give it away for free? Doesn't that, you know, it doesn't that miss the whole point of trying to make money? But no, the the point is that it's a long-term strategy. So the point is that if you've done a good job and you've written a good book is that you want to get it in as many hands as possible in your free launch. Because if you can have hundreds or thousands of people download your book and they start talking about it and they feel like they got value from you, they're going to promote it and they're going to review it and they're going to share it. And then other people will buy your book once it's 99 cents and $1.99. And this will help you have long-term momentum and long-term sales. So that is what I did. And I think anyone who doesn't have a platform should absolutely do this. So by the way, 2017, I had no platform. No one knew who I was. I, I didn't have, I mean, I had maybe 200 Instagram followers. It wasn't like I had any anybody any following in 2017. So that is what I did for the launch strategy. Now, part of the strategy is having a launch team. I did not do this in any formal way in 2017, but I did do something that worked really, really well. And what I did is I utilized Facebook groups. Mm. This wasn't, I didn't do this actually in an intentional way, but looking back, this worked out for me very well. So even in 2016, before I started writing this book, I was engaged in a couple of Facebook groups just because I genuinely enjoyed them and I was very engaged. Um, they weren't even necessarily about financial stuff or money stuff. I think one of them was more political, but they happened to have all female millennials, which was what which was my target audience. So I was really engaged. And anytime a finance question would come up, I would jump on and I loved to do this. I would jump on, I would say, hey, I'm Rachel. I'm a former financial advisor. Here's what I think. And I would type out a really long, helpful response. And people really appreciated that. So after this happened enough, people would start to tag me in these Facebook posts. And they was, if, if somebody asked a money question, they would say, hey, you need to ask Rachel. Or they would say, Rachel's your girl. She will answer this question. So over the course of a few months, I became this go-to finance guru in a couple of these Facebook groups. Um, one of them had something like 12,000 members, most of which were wow. female millennials. So when it came time to write my book, I was like, hey, you all, I'm thinking about writing this finance book. You know, what do you think? I'm kind of unsure about it. And they were like, oh my gosh, Rachel, you have to write this book. I would read anything that you write. You make money so easy to understand. Like they were super excited. And I kind of kept them engaged in the process as I wrote the book. Like I would say, hey, can you all help me figure out a cover? I'm really torn or I would do polls of like, what do you think I should title the book? What should the subtitle be? So like they were emotionally invested in this book because they had such a say in how it was going to look, what the title was going to be. Like they were involved in it. So what, when it came time for the book to come out, they were ready to download it, review it, share it, promote it. And it was basically like I had a launch team without having a formal launch team. Um, and again, I didn't do any of that intentionally at the time because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. But looking back, it, it was it was basically a marketing strategy that ended up working very well for the launch of that first book. And what about the sort of longevity 
from 2017 to now 2021, almost 2022 on Amazon. I mean, even Amazon has changed so much in the last few years. Do you spend money on promotions on advertising or like what would you suggest to somebody who's who's just getting started that way? Yeah, I well, first of all, I've done I've made a lot of mistakes which we can talk about. I <laughs> I didn't do anything the right way starting out. Um I didn't even have a website for an entire year after I launched my book because again, this wasn't something I was trying to build a business off at first. Right. So, and when I, the book started taking off, I was shocked. I was surprised. And then I was like, oh, maybe I should have a website or something. Um, and so when it came time to think about marketing and making sure it was selling well, I actually, to this day, haven't done any paid marketing or advertising, which is um, really cool. It is amazing. Sold, yeah, thank you. It has sold organically very well on Amazon and through word of mouth. Um, one thing that authors need to think about is after you go through your initial bubble and your initial network of people who are going to buy your book, it's like, what then? How do you continue to get in front of new readers? Because mm. this isn't a consumable product that people are going to buy over and over again. Once they buy your book once, they're not going to buy your book again and again, unless they're buying it for gifts, which is nice. But chances are it's it's one and done. So the problem that authors need to think about is how do you continuously get in front of new readers and new audiences? The hope is that it will sell by word of mouth it will sell organically on Amazon, but it's only going to do that if you have a strong launch to begin with. And then it's up to the author to continue marketing it. So I have found that getting on podcasts, getting on clubhouse panels, getting on virtual summits, anything where you can cross promote your audiences with each other is a win-win. So for example, anytime I'm on a podcast, I'm always promoting the episode to my audience too, because I want the host to, I want it to be a win-win for both me and the host. And anytime I'm on a virtual event and I'm getting in front of other people's audiences, I want them to get in front of mine too. So I'm always looking at how I can make it a win-win and how can I continue to get in front of new audiences. So I've done a lot of organic marketing by being guests on shows and, and doing things like that. From Foreign Policy, I'm Rena Nainen, the host of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women. Over the past few years, we've looked at how women around the world are changing societal norms to increase their economic power. This season, we're focusing completely on girls, how they're pushing for a brighter, more powerful future, and what the rest of us can do to set them up for success. Join us for stories about girl power, young women who are fighting for change, to give themselves a chance to live a life of their own choosing. That's season six of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. So at what point did you say, okay, <laughs> I think I actually have to structure a business around this. And then how did you decide what would be those, whether it's courses or whatever you created, those additional sources of touch points and also income? I guess it was probably, well, 2018 was when I figured I should put a website up, which <laughs> wasn't a very good website because I made it myself and threw it up there, but people were asking me about it. And 2019, I wrote my second book. It was never something where I was like, oh, I'm going to create a business. I don't think I had that thought until I quit my job in 2019. 
it was just like, oh, well, I'll write another book. And then in 2020, it was like, oh, I'll, I'll create an online course. I just kept listening to what my audience was asking me for and putting out new products. Um, but for example, in 2019, as I was gearing up to quit my job and you know posting about this on social media, and I was 27 at the time, and by then I was making 10 grand a month in passive income, which was mostly from the rental properties. People were like, wait a second, you're quitting your job and you're retiring <laughs> and you're 27. <laughs> and they're like, what the heck are you doing? So I decided to write a book about passive income and early retirement because I could tell that there was a lot of interest in the topic. People wanted to know how I was doing what I was doing. And by that time, I was kind of obsessed with passive income and I wanted to learn how I could make as many passive income streams as possible. So that's when I decided to write my second book, Passive Income Aggressive Retirement. And basically, that's how I've continued to build up my business. It's any time my platform is asking me a lot of questions about something or they're struggling with something, it's like, oh, well, I, I can do something to help them. And then I'll put out the next product or service. And I think that served me really well instead of I think the, the mistake most business owners make is they say, oh, I really want to create this product and I'll sell it to people versus, oh, this is a struggle I've identified that people are having, or this is a hole in the market. This is something I can help people with and I can solve a problem here. I think that's a better way to create a product or service to sell to people, if that makes sense. Yeah. And this may be a bit of an obvious question. And we've, we've kind of talked about this, but just to talk about it really, I guess, bluntly, what is publishing these books? Like, what has this done for for your career? Um, I mean, I think it's skyrocketed your career, but how has this opened doors that maybe wouldn't have existed without these books? Oh, it's been amazing. Um, so many opportunities have opened up for me. And for example, just because of Money Honey, there was a college in Florida that reached out to me and wanted me to fly me out. And they paid me thousands of dollars to deliver a keynote to their students just because of my first book. Um, I've had Business Insider and CNBC and Penny Hoarder and New York Times reach out to me for publications and to be and to write articles about me just because of my books. Like even before the courses happened and before I blew up on TikTok and all the other stuff, I do think that being a published author adds credibility in a way that having other things doesn't. And people see that you have books and they're like, "Wow, you're a published author." Even if you're self-published, it's still, "Wow, you have a book. You're a, you're an author." And there's been a lot of doors that have opened and um, I think the credibility helps. You know, I've had people reach out for one-on-one -on -one coaching. Hey, can you teach me about this? Do you do you offer mentoring? Can you do this? And it's just been a game changer. Do you think you would ever go the traditional publishing route? I actually looked into it for my second book because I figured I have a decent platform now. I've had a lot of success with my first book. I have leverage to negotiate. Like, let me see what they can offer. And I got so far as I had some literary agents that were willing to represent me, which that in itself is really, really hard to do. But at the end of the day, it, it still just didn't make sense. I still didn't understand what they could offer me that I couldn't do myself and I could do better for myself. Yeah. So I didn't pursue it. Now, here's the only way that I would work with a traditional publisher and that I have is to have someone represent you to get foreign rights deals. Because if I want my book translated and to be sold in other countries, like actually translated to get foreign rights deals in other countries, you really have to have a traditional publisher to do that. So I started getting inquiries from publishers in other countries who wanted like the Chinese translation rights and the Vietnamese translation rights. And so I did have to hire a literary agent based in the US in order to work those deals. And so I've earned a few thousand dollars more than I otherwise would have because there was no way for me to do that in a self-publishing route. So so I have done it from that sense. Otherwise, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I guess we'll say we'll never know <laughs> in the future. <laughs> is, there, is there a third book jostling around in your head or are you like two two's good? There is always a third book. <laughs> uh, I do want to write a third book. The problem is I've had such clear ideas for the first two with such unique value propositions. And I haven't figured out a way to do that for a third book about real estate investing. So 
I'm noodling on it. I do want to write a third and probably a fourth and fifth, but it's got to come to me. (laughs) I hear you. It's got to be the right time, right? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I want to summarize a little bit. So if somebody's listening and they're in the very introductory stage, they they have the idea that as far as they've gotten, what are a few action steps you think they should take uh, right away to to really move this idea along? I would say, here's what people might not want to hear, because don't go straight from having an idea to starting to outline and write it, because you really need to validate your idea. And you want to spend a ton of time up front validating your idea because the last thing you want to do is go through with writing this whole book only to realize it's not going to sell. Um, So that's why course creators are told to pre-sell the course before you even make the course, which is something I do. So here's what I mean by that. Figure out who your target reader would be and then go ask them what their struggles are and then write the book tailored to that. And also ask yourself, for example, money, honey. Okay. There are thousands of personal finance books out there. Ask yourself, why would somebody buy my book over the thousands that are already out there? And if you can't clearly articulate that, you are going to have a hard time selling it to people and making money off of it. So you really need to understand your unique value proposition. You need to understand what problems you're solving for people and be able to speak to them on an emotional level. For example, with Money Honey, it would be easy for me to say, well, this is a book that helps you pay off debt. Okay, no one cares about that. (laughs) So always ask yourself, here's a good exercise, so that what? Okay, pay off debt so that what? So Mm -hmm. that you stop living paycheck to paycheck. So that what? So that you can quit your job. So that what? So that you can spend more time with your family. Okay, now spending more time with your family is something that resonates with people. That's something that means something to people and can speak to them on an emotional level. Or so that you're going to stop being abused by your job, emotionally abused or emotionally abused by your boss in your job. Okay, that's something that speaks to people on an emotional level. So you really need to get to the emotional benefit and the transformation that your book is going to deliver to people. Spend a lot of time on that up front, and the rest is going to be a lot easier. Wow, it's such great advice. Well, Rachel, I, I want you to tell everyone, of course, where they can go to grab both your books. But if if somebody is interested in working with you to help them write their book, is that something you offer as well? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I can do one-on-one coaching on on any topic. So I'm happy to do that. And in my second book, Passive Income Aggressive Retirement, this is one of the passive income streams I talk about. So I have a whole section about royalty income and how to self-publish your book. So I go into a lot of detail there as well. All right. So tell us all where where do we find you? Where do we connect with you? And how can we grab a copy of your books? Thank you. Yes. Both of my books, Money, Honey, and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement are on Amazon in ebook, paperback, and audio. Um, My website is moneyhoneyrachel.com. And Shauna, what I'd love to do for your listeners is if anyone would like to download my Passive Income Starter Kit, I will give that for free. So you can go to moneyhoneyrachel.com forward slash passive income to download that. I really love Rachel's honesty in this episode. Yeah, sure. Self-publishing is hard and you learn a lot through the process, but it can also be super rewarding and you just never know what might happen. I don't think Rachel ever knew that when she started out self-publishing, she would get to the point where she's making five to $10,000 a month somewhat passively. That is just incredible. So if you have an aspiration of writing a book, like I do, bookmark this episode, and then I suggest come back to it often. And as I'm learning to do, don't just wait for a publisher to find you. Go find the audience. I don't care if you make $50 a month, $100 a month, $1,000 a month. It doesn't matter, right? Any extra revenue is extra revenue, and we could all use more money. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, share it with friends, family members, anybody who you know might have just a slight interest in self-publishing. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guest, as well as our sponsors who make this podcast possible. 
I'll see you right back here in a few days for a brand new episode. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode.